James O'Brien on LBC. It is 10.43. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I think we should probably steer things towards Brexit next because today looks crunchy to me to stay with the breakfast cereal theme. Today, today looks... Well, can I tell you what I think is happening? And not for the first time. I don't think this is an opinion. I genuinely think this is a statement of fact. The border in Ireland, as I have been telling you for the best part of two years, is going to be the uh, the fence at which it all falls apart. Not not because it's the most important element of the negotiation or indeed of the process, but just because it's the most acute and the most urgent. All the rest of it you can deny. So when, as happened yesterday, the British car industry reports that we could see an utter collapse if we have to, um, if we can't have basically anything you make in the European Union that contains a part that was made in Britain could be off the table. So anything that we make and seek to export to them or sell within that market, anything that contains anything that's been made here could become um, unsellable. The, look at what the Dutch government have done on this, advising their own businesses on how to cope with it. Th- these are statements of fact. That is what the government has done. If we come out with no deal, that is what will happen. But you can still deny that, uh, and I understand. The more you've got invested in Brexit, the more desperate you are perhaps to continue to deny the possible reality. Um, the people who are pretending that coming out on World Trade Organization terms are now by far the most dangerous people in the country. But again, the more you've got invested... Imagine if you'd fallen out with your children about this. Imagine if you'd fallen out with your partner. Imagine if you'd fallen out with your colleagues. You've got the radio on at work and you're looking at each other and, and, and you're the, you have to still be the bloke that backs Brexit because the humiliation of admitting you were wrong is, is, is going to be immense. It's going to be epic. And you think it's going to be bad for you. Imagine what it's going to be like for David Davis. So I get that. And that's why Ireland is the, is the clincher because we could sit here, if I imagine myself in your shoes, I could sit here and pretend that I genuinely believe... Uh, coming out as a, as, a, as a third country under WTO rules is anything other than a disaster. I could pretend that I know more about the car industry than the car industry does. I could pretend that I know more about the port of Dover than the port of Dover does. I could, if you like, um, pretend I was Digby Jones uh, and pretend that I understand stuff that I simply don't, that I demonstrably don't. And I get that. I get that. That's psychological. And, and, and I have a degree of sympathy for people in that position. But what Ireland has always represented is the point at which the politics becomes pure, not psychological. It doesn't matter what you think or believe or hope. When it comes down to the tension between single market integrity and the Good Friday Agreement, everything falls to pieces. It, it, it was always going to, and it, and it always will. Unless, and this is the one tiny element of debate left, unless you want to claim that there is some magical solution to frictionless trade that hasn't yet been invented but will be soon. And that is where we are today, because that's the only way in which you can hold on to the idea that this could still be pulled off without um, a, without crashing out with no deal and, and watching the country wither on the vine. The only way in which you could pretend it's still doable is by punting the notion or subscribing to the belief that there is a... I don't want to say magic, but it is an as-yet-uninvented way in which you can have no hard border and frictionless trade, OK? Despite having a border between two separate customs unions, the one that we're going to be in on our own, and the one that the European Union is currently in. So you can just about cling to that idea, that theory, but it's a theory. And what the European Union and the British government agreed last year was that we will have to have a backstop in place until you can tell me what that as yet uninvented... I mean, this, this is where I get a little bit... Um, almost a bit trippy, to be honest with you, because it's so blindingly obvious what I'm saying. It's so unerringly simple... It's so undeniably true. This is history that I'm relating to you now. And yet the Secretary of State for the European Union, for leaving the European Union, apparently still doesn't understand it. The only thing simpler than what I'm explaining now, arguably, is David Davis. But I don't think he's stupid. I think he's incredibly lazy. I can only presume that he doesn't understand it because he hasn't tried to. So what he agreed, without realising it, last year, was that the backstop would involve the border moving to the Irish Sea, in the absence of a solution. 
Now, there is currently no solution. So Theresa May can't put a date on when the as-yet-uninvented solution will be in place. Theresa May cannot say to the European Union, we will end the transition period or we will end the backstop arrangement on the 12th of June 2022 until she can tell them what is going to be in place on the 13th of June 2022. Do you see? I, look, I, I should, in the interest of arrogance, actually, I should say that if I am getting this wrong, then do feel free to explain it to me. But as I understand it, you cannot put a date, an expiry date, on any of this until you can tell both sides, i.e. our own government, our own people get told, and the Irish people, the European Union gets told, what's going to be there the minute the expiry date arrives. So this backstop will only last until the 12th of June, 2022. I've made that date up, by the way. You can't sell that. You cannot have that as a negotiating position if you can't tell everybody what happens on the 13th of June, 2022. Now, to me, that is about as close to clarity as I can contemplate. I can't think of anything clearer than that. And yet, if I've understood the tension between David Davis and Theresa May today, they are at loggerheads over her refusal to put a date on something, a refusal that is entirely contingent upon the fact that they don't know what will be there the next day. So David Davis is saying that the government's negotiating position should be, we're going to leave on June the X, 2022, without being able to tell you what's going to be there on June the X plus one, 2022. And that's just nuts, right? Everyone can see that that's nuts. This isn't opinion. I don't think this is opinion. This surely is just fact. If you enter into any form of contract with anybody, you would be expected to tell them what happens when the contract ends. So the whole negotiation process is built upon the uh, desire, under the terms of the Good Friday Agreement, arguably the absolute constitutional and political necessity to have identical trading conditions on both sides of the Irish border. What David Davis should have been doing and should have done during the course of the last two years is explain and come up with a plan for achieving that. Isn't that his job? If he's Secretary of State for leaving the European Union, isn't his job to establish the circumstances in which it can be done? Have I gone completely doolally when I wonder out loud if it's absurd to speculate on whether or not the Secretary of State for exiting the European Union should have been involved in coming up with a plan for exiting the European Union? I, I mean, can you see the Emperor's buttocks yet? Or do you still think that he's wearing wonderful robes? The Secretary of State for exiting the European Union today is protesting about his own failure to come up with a plan for exiting the European Union. And he's blaming it on Theresa May. Because what Theresa May won't do is stick a date on it, after which she can't tell anyone what will happen. This is what our country looks like now, from the outside. And yes, die, doff cap, tug, forelock, speak nonsense, vote Rees Mogg, you'll still have people claiming that we will sail off into the seven seas under World Trade Organization rules that none of them understand. Speak to old Kieran, the van driver, tooling his way to Brussels and back every single day with a much, much, much deeper understanding of what that trade and that journey involves than anybody in the cabinet, whether they're Lever, Remainer or somewhere in between. So... What is David Davis doing? That's the question I'd like you to answer for me today. How can the Secretary of State for the exiting of the European Union somehow think that he has a point of principle upon which he could be poised to resign? I was hearing 50-50 before we came on air this morning. That seems to anybody sensible to be built upon the fact that the Secretary of State for exiting the European Union has failed to come up with a plan for exiting the European Union. What's David Davis doing? What's he up to? Hit the numbers now, you will get through. 03456060973. Because nobody, nobody with an IQ in double figures surely can fail to understand why Theresa May can't put an expiry date on something unless she can tell you what's going to happen at the end of that period. And that was David Davis's job. What's he been doing since the referendum? What's he been doing since he got this gig? What, what has he actually been doing? Does anybody know? Has anybody seen him sort of, I don't know, has he been painting? Has he been building an extension? 
Has he uh, put a granny flat above the garage? What the hell has he been doing? And today, the sheer undiluted arrogance, this curious combination that the Digby Jones, the Douglas Carswells, this astonishing combination of ignorance and arrogance has created a scenario in which David Davis thinks that he has a point of principle to make about the fact that he's failed to come up with a plan to leave the European Union, despite having the best part of two years, in charge of coming up with a plan to leave the European Union. Now, I, I know that... Oh, I not know, that's not fair. I'm 99% certain that I haven't put a foot wrong in, in that description to you of what happens. And I'm 99% certain that the only way you can refute or dispute anything I've just said is by moving away from the political and going back to the psychological, where the psychological represents the belief that something will come up, something will happen. We will be able to do this. And that psychological belief is built partly, I think we can all agree now, on a sense of what has been described as English exceptionalism. So it's this belief that I don't know what it's going to be, but it's going to be great, and I know it's going to be great because it's going to be English or British, right? That's, that is pretty much all that we've got left, I think. Don't think that it is coincidental that the editor of the newspaper that did more to push Brexit to con the British people into going for Brexit is now walking the plank. Don't think that's a coincidence. I have been telling you for two years that they will all try to quit the field. Hasn't Farage, didn't, while I was on holiday, didn't Farage even claim that he never said things would be better after Brexit? I, I genuinely thought I might have imagined that when it popped up on my Twitter feed um, last week. But I've checked, it's true. All of them, every single one of them will try to wash their hands of this, except for the ones that are doubling down on the delusion. And that's where your Reese Moggs come in. That's where the ambition of someone like Michael Gove to be Prime Minister allows him to pretend that we're not all going to hell in a handcart. Because even if we are going to hell in a handcart, if he ends up Prime Minister um, during any part of that process, for him it would all have been worthwhile. I'd file Boris Johnson under that as well. I find Rees Mogg a little more confusing, and I think it's probably um, important to understand his, his financial situation and his... Um, uh, trading company rather better than I do before you can perhaps speculate on precisely what he's expecting to get out of all of this. Because anybody informed or sensible or uh, paying attention can see that this was always going to happen. And yet every day I open up my newspapers and turn on my radio and turn on my television to hear people that I used to think were rather good at this. To hear people that I used to think were clever, to hear people that I used to think were interested in evidence and facts and truth, and they're expressing surprise. They're expressing surprise at what's going on. How can you possibly be surprised that Theresa May can't put a date on when the backstop will end because she hasn't got a Scooby-Doo what is going to be on the Irish border when the backstop ends? And David Davis today throwing his toys out of his ridiculous little pram because he has failed to come up with a plan that he said severally several 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 times he said would be easy i i tried to find the little the, the thread that we should have pulled harder not us we've got nothing to apologize for on this program but the country at large and i go back always to those tweets that david davis issued when he said that the day after brexit we wouldn't be going to brussels we'd be going to berlin to strike up a trade deal with the germans uh, an intervention on social media that is yet to be deleted and which displays an ignorance of the most simple premises of international trade and European Union rules that, frankly, your average kindergarten pupil could have got their head around. So David Davis began in this job not understanding anything, and today he is reportedly poised to resign precisely because he still doesn't understand anything. And the man, the cheerleader who has allowed it all to happen, the man who has stuck steel of the new Iron Lady on the front pages and crushed the saboteurs, oh, he's off. On your radio, on your phone, and here. Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation, this is LBC.